Welcome to Get Moving TV. I'm Dr. Chris Landon and I serve as your host. As you know, over these, whatever, 10 years, I really try and find things around Ventura County. It's a remarkable place. We have filmmakers, we've got artists, we've got uh, music makers, we have scientists. Uh, and so when, when I, I run across somebody who has a personality and uh, some skills, uh, in my house we had a wonderful party for three uh, school teachers, local school teachers who were each turning 50, look 20, especially when these guys played. So uh, I want to introduce you to Patrick Simpson. Uh, Patrick, uh, did, you're in a band uh, that that day. What's the name of the band that uh, that you Midlife play? Crisis. Midlife Crisis. So, you know, that's that's a, a lot of us. Uh, uh, you know, we pick up the guitar and do our YouTube lessons. And so, you were kind enough to come out to my house, and I still owe you a check there, uh, to to give me a lesson and mm -hmm. fill in all those things that you just you can watch all the YouTube videos in the world, uh, but you came from somewhere. Uh, uh, what, 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 what's your career been? You've been a guitar player your whole life professionally, or have you done other things? Yeah, kind of. Uh, yeah, I started playing when I was about in eighth grade, you know, right around the time the Beatles run, Ed Sullivan. I saw that and said, I want to do that. Uh, I ended up working for the Navy for 39 years, doing electronics, traveled all over the world, working on airborne electronic attack, and uh, I retired, now I play guitar. So, so in those 39 years, did you have a, a guitar in your... I did, yeah. yeah. I played the whole time, but obviously not as much as I do now. I've, uh, I used to work, uh, had a music therapy class in prison, and Wolf had a, uh, a broom handle that he had shaved in, and he had never played a guitar. He'd been in prison, and he would just practice his scales and finally got him a guitar. So, wow. Uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting times. Uh, so, besides, uh, of course, the girls and uh, the, you know, throwing TVs out the window and seeing which <laughs> chair will stick into the wall as you throw it in the hotel, uh, what, 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 what brings you to music? What, uh, what pleasure do you get from music? I've been attracted to music ever since I was a small boy. My parents would listen to the radio and I would pay attention. Uh, to the songs, more so probably than a lot of kids my age, knew the words to most of the hit songs and uh, would sit there and wait patiently for a song that I really liked to play again because in those days you didn't have the tape, you didn't have the means to stream it, so that was patience, a lot of patience. So you'd be a TikTok sensation now, though, the singing four-year-old. Uh, yeah. So, and who, who bought your first guitar then? My parents bought it for my eighth grade graduation present. And, and we have, I, I think, some of your 30 to 50 guitar collection <laughs> here today. Uh, what, what, what kind of guitar was it? Do you even remember? It was from Japan, and it had a neck that was much like a baseball bat. Didn't look like it was made for human hands, or at least not a young boy's hands. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was hard to play, and there were no instructional materials like there are now. So you had to pretty much find someone to show you a few chords, rudimentary chords, then you would sit in front of a record player and repeat it, lift the needle, lift the needle, until you had a sense of what they were doing. And that's how I learned. Well, I have probably I don't know, a thousand records sitting in my, uh, my garage. I don't think there's, a, there's an entire generation where you go, oh, at the records, I mean, CD store, I mean, eight, eight track player, I mean, uh, yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, what, what was that record that you played over and over again? Well, one that I played a lot was uh, Stairway to Heaven. I was being tasked with learning it for a band, and I wanted to do it correctly, and I worked on that for weeks. You know, my, my wife and my young son would go to bed, and I would have my Sansui headphones on. I'd lean forward and then just do it over and over until I felt like I could do it, you know, copy the record, and that's how I learned it. Yeah, no YouTube video to... <laughs> there was no YouTube, the no. <laughs> yeah. Well, plus they they tune down half a step, or uh, yeah, or or uh, Keith Richards was uh, Keith Richards had a special tuning uh, that made so, it impossible to figure out in standard tuning what the heck he was doing. That's an open G tuning, and what he does also that makes it even trickier is he takes off the sixth string because he doesn't use it. But yeah, that's the secret to Keith Richards is the open G, and he uses a couple others, but open G is pretty much where he lives. Yeah, so I'd, I'd try and play. But I never figured that part out, so it makes it easier. Gave me no satisfaction. I got to tell you. Yeah. Once you do the open G, though, it's much easier. Yes. It just opens it up for you. Yes, but yeah, you see what the heck he's thinking and doing, and 
Yeah, there's a certain synergy between the strings that you get with that tuning that you don't get otherwise. It gives it a kind of grind. So with uh, Midlife Crisis, this is uh, uh, the one of how many bands? Now I'm playing with three bands. I was in five before the, the COVID hit. But yeah, I play with Johnny and the Love Handles uh, around town at all the wineries. And I've been playing in a group called the Splinters for well, since the late 80s. We uh, get together every Tuesday and do whatever comes from country, old rock and roll, whatever we want to do. Well, that, there's the uh, uh, the write-off room down in uh, down in the valley, and it's this guy who's just got too much money, and so he has a nightclub and brings in whoever's in town, and if they're 80 years old, but what, whoever the backup band is, are they're all those studio cats and That's uh, and, and the like. So. Uh, in terms of increasing your business, uh, what, are the, what are some of the wineries you play at so they can make sure and support you in the future? Uh, let's see. Uh, I've played at Stray Cellars with a horn band. I was in the Renegades for a couple of years, and we played there a bunch. I played at Four Bricks, uh, Plan B, Cantara Cellars, Flatfish Brewing, and there used to be a winery on Market Street here that uh, we played at several times before COVID. And then saloons? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. I think uh, yeah. All d Main Street, Ventura, I've been played just about everywhere down there. And in Santa Barbara back in the 90s, I was all up and down that street, State Street. So, Well, well good. So now we know kind of where, where you were for 39 years and then <laughs> finally escaped to your, your life's ambition here. Yep. Well, uh, you have a guitar in your lap. I, 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 I try and keep one in arm's reach because people like you tell me, keep it in arm's reach and... Could you get a metronome, Doc? Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, it's one of these days. I've been uh, telling a lot of people that lately, uh, and I didn't yeah. have one when I was younger, but yeah. I'm finding that that's probably the, the best advice I could give someone. Yeah, it's right on my phone, it's there, so but eventually I, I'll try yeah. to remember. I spent a lot of time playing by myself when I was younger, mm -hmm. and that's when you get with other people, there's a certain time constant that you have to adhere to, mm -hmm. and it's good to get that instilled in you earlier than later. So when, when uh, you play bass, uh, who do you listen to for that time constant? Or is there a part of the drum that you listen yeah. to? Oh, yeah. The bass player should probably listen to the kick drum. Okay. That's, that's where you should live. And the guitar player should listen to either the snare or the hi-hat. That tells me what my right hand is supposed to be doing. Perfect. But tell me about the guitar you have in your hand, Susan. Since uh, you... This is a Fender Stratocaster, which I've had many of these over the years. I love them. And uh, it was created in 1954. And it, if you look at a 1954 Stratocaster, it looks much the same as this. But there are several little improvements that make it more playable. But yeah, I, I like these a lot. So, and uh, why do you like it? I feel like I have everything I need when, I, when I'm playing a gig. If I have one of these in my hand, mm -hmm. I have every confidence that I've got all I need guitar-wise to do whatever's going to be asked of me. So. Yeah, uh, it has good sustain then, is that? Decent sustain. Oh, okay. A uh, Gibson has much better sustain. We'll, we'll, we'll get to okay. the rest of the rack here. One of the things about yeah. this is it has a bolt-on neck, which mm -hmm. was done purposely so that it could be repaired easily because it was made for working musicians. So that's a... Uh, so when you're smashing into a... Yeah. You can yeah. replace the... Uh, you can protect yourself in the bar room and if you need yeah. to... So yeah, it just has a very sweet sound to me and you can do most anything with it. Okay, well, uh, I'm gonna have you demonstrate in just a sec, uh, but there, so I see three pickups. Right. Uh, so there's probably three positions you put it in. And Actually, you there's talk, five. Yeah, and t so which, uh, well, if you could just put it in one position, play something, tell us, tell us a little bit about it, then we'll, we'll capture what it sounds like. Okay, I, one of my go-tos is between the, uh, the middle pickup and the back pickup. It has a really sweet sound. This, uh, you can make it sound mean if you want to, but yeah, it's, it's got a, a sweetness about it. Show me mean. Got a little snarl. Now, in terms of the harmonics, of, uh, the pickup that's closest to the neck, what, what kind of sound does that give you? Since it's sensing the string closer to the termination point on mm -hmm. the, uh, the bridges, you get more of the higher 
order harmonics on it. Mm -hmm. It's got more bite, they say. Now you seem to, uh, the, uh, I think this is a big room, but I'm hearing some echo in there somewhere. Well, yes you do, good ear. Yeah, I have a pedal, it's a digital uh, delay. Uh -huh. And what it is, it's got a little chip in there that's like a bucket brigade. It captures a little bit of the, uh, the sound, saves it up, sends it to the next little stage in the bucket brigade, and lets it out at a certain interval that is defined by the knobs, a time. It's a time-based effect. So uh, what, what kinds of songs would I hear that on? Oh, uh, all through the 60s, you'd hear it on like surf music. Reverb too, but yeah, mm -hmm. delay. Country too, a lot of country would use that. Now, with uh, 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 Les Paul, didn't he big, build a big cavern for, for himself to get that echo? He, uh, he did, but he also was experimenting with tape machines with multiple heads, and he's the one that pretty much pioneered that, which is in use all the time now. And that's the same idea. What mm -hmm. you have is a chip that takes a little bit of the sound and at a given interval hands it off to another one, another one, and what you have is what they, they call a bucket brigade, Mm -hmm. But there's a little degradation at each handoff. There's a price mm -hmm. to be paid. Mm -hmm. And that's how you get this characteristic sound of, of this delay. Would, do you want to walk through any of it? Because we've got more guitars to go. Uh, are there any other pedals that really uh, come out with the... Yeah, I'm very partial to tremolo because of the time period I grew up listening to music. So. Mm -hmm. It was on a lot of records. Couldn't figure out what they were doing until I was able to do it myself. But yeah, that's that's probably one of my favorites. Okay. Uh, what do you want to switch guitars, or do you want to talk? About, are there other pedals that you tend to use on stage? <clears throat> yeah, here's one that that I'm kind of partial to lately. Stand up and do this. It mimics a spinning speaker, yep. the Leslie. Okay, and I see a, a wah pedal there. Is that yes, you do. I have to stand up for that one. Okay. It's a filter. It's uh, sweeping a range of frequencies mm -hmm. and highlighting them by virtue of where the pedal is, and you get that characteristic wah. I like it. What, do you want to uh, show another guitar off? Sure. So while you're while you're doing that, did you want to see this one? Oh, uh, allowed to touch it. Yeah, it's very nice. Oh, oh my gosh. So yeah, that's why they had roadies. I think was uh, yes. they, between the weight of the guitars and the moment. Hey, this is the heaviest guitar I own. Might want to try. Okay, I haven't worked out yet today. <laughs> there you go. Oh, okay. That's 15 pounds. Okay. Well, here's your log. <laughs> Indeed. Now, your, your pick is so thick. I, uh, shouldn't I just, if I want to pick fast, don't I want a really thin pick? What the heck? That's what you would think. Yeah. And I used to think that, too, until I did research into Middle Eastern instruments where they, they pick very quickly, mm -hmm. and do a lot of double picking, and they use the thickest pick they can find. So I started doing that, and ever since. Makes good sense. And I see people besides uh, uh, picks, there's a, uh, for a good guitar player, they're using their fingers a lot. They right, don't, right. They don't yes. mess with a pick at all. Yeah, and that's becoming a lot more 
prevalent. You know, that's, I admire people that can do that. A lot thicker, heavier sound. Mm -hmm. A lot more harmonic content. Mm -hmm. So where, where uh, in terms of a Les Paul there, where, where would you see that used more? More in jazz, more in? Uh, nowadays you see it a lot in country because Gibson's in Nashville. Mm -hmm. And they're putting these guitars in the hands of those people. So yeah, it's, it's very prevalent there now. But yeah, these are solid guitars. Well, good, yeah, good sustain. And now it, instead of having three pickups, it just has the right, the two. I don't see a whammy bar. Nope. Typically, no. This is a really traditional guitar company, Gibson. Mm -hmm. And they were making guitars for 100 years plus before they began doing solid body electrics. And that was a bit of a stretch for them because they, they didn't really like it. They, you know, they made fun of yeah. Fender. Uh, yeah, what's he you thinking? Know, called it a, a log. A log, yeah. And as you can see, this one has a glued in neck, mm -hmm. which gives it a different sound quality. And they use some uh, tone woods that, like mahogany with a maple cap, and that gives mm -hmm. them a balance. So do different woods have different? Yes, they do. Yes. And they've been making Les Paul since 1952. That was the first one. And that was because Les Paul was very popular in the, in the day. So they did a, an endorsement with him and made a guitar to his specs. Mm -hmm. And this one has changed quite a bit over the years. But it's still recognizable oh, as yeah. a Les Paul. It's... Just like the, the Telecaster since 1951 looks exactly the same. Well, I think that don't, they have copyrights even on their heads. Oh, they so, do. Yes, yeah, they do, indeed. You're Japanese and you put in a, a Stratocaster-like head, but it better not overlay. And... Yeah, there was a period of time in, I think it was the 70s, when some of the, the quality and whatnot on the, uh, the American guitars was starting to slide mm -hmm. a bit. And the Japanese began, make, began making copies. And that became what they call the lawsuit era. Mm -hmm. The cease and desist started flying around, but they made very good guitars. Well, and then I also remember something about the woods, too. Uh, didn't Gibson have to turn some wood back into the federal government because it was endangered? Right, right. Some of the rosewood mm -hmm. was endangered. In fact, if you traveled with certain guitars, Gibson guitars in particular, and you went to, say, Europe, they would be seized. Contraband. Yeah. So what, in terms of, of the wood, so uh, I guess uh, Koa has its own characteristics. So yes, they do. Yeah. Above 5,000 feet in Hawaii or wherever in the <laughs> yeah. heck. I mean, that's, uh, it, it depends on the moisture content, the density, and that's how well it uh, you know, transmits vibrations. One mm -hmm. of the things that you see a lot of people uh, using older guitars because it's dried out, and also it's been played so many hours that the wood knows how to transmit those vibrations. I mean, it just, mm -hmm. when it's first made, it still thinks it's a tree. After about 30, <laughs> 40 years, then it knows it's a guitar. So, so yeah, I, I was yeah, seasoned. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I just remember the, and on the Hateful Eight when uh, uh, he accidentally breaks the real Martin double knot from 1908 or whatever it was, yeah, uh, Kurt Russell. Oh. No, that wasn't the prop guitar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not so good. So, what else about the about the Les Paul should we know? So the they're heavy. They, they are heavy, large. which means a lot of sustain, I guess. Yes, that adds to sustain and back problems. <laughs> if you play four hours a night in a club, standing it can, up. Yeah. yeah, I had a doctor once tell me to stop playing my Les Paul. I was getting uh -huh. inflammation, so huh. he goes, "Put that Les Paul down." So. Well, maybe if you don't mind playing it for a little bit, we'll, we'll capture a little and then we'll move on to the next guitar. The neck pickup, by the way, too. Yes. Well, uh, the other thing we've talked about is just notes. Everybody wants to speed their way through, uh, uh, get, get as many notes in as possible. And we've talked, you know, the, really the guitarist here is a human voice to talk. And you're, exactly. Yeah. You're 
uh, what do you do to those strings to make it give a, give a more uh, of a vocal try kind to of do characteristic? Is I, I read a lot about it when I was trying to come up to speed on this, and a lot of the players that I admired would indicate that they, when they would bend a note, they would put a little vibrato at the top to make it sound like a, a voice. Mm -hmm. And also, by varying the that, you can make it quick or... I used to go in a guitar store uh, years ago, and there was an instructor, whenever I would try out a guitar, he'd come running down because he could recognize my vibrato, so that was kind of a compliment. Most of the sometimes uh, people uh, pre-bend the string and then bend it yes. in. So they, yeah, more you know, the country. Yeah, that's a, definitely a country technique, the pre-bend, because you're doing a lot of oblique bends in country too, where you're bending against a set uh, pitch like. We have a Strat here too. That was the Strat first, oh, Strat. but I have a, a Telecaster tele. too. Good. Sorry. No problem. Yeah, definitely a workout there. So. Yes, it is. Yeah. So as. Uh, so the Strat's your go-to and the Tele's your... They're becoming my go-to. I use them a lot more now. Because they um, are. What, what, what uh, characteristics of it? Well, when they keep you honest because there's nothing there but you and the guitar. Everything that comes out of it is coming out of you. So, yeah, it's uh, a lot of really good guitar players. You know, once they get to a Tele, they say that that's... Like I said, I'm using it a lot more too now, trying mm -hmm. to see if I'm up to the challenge. But uh, one of the things I like about these is they're simple. Mm -hmm. And this was created in 1951, and so was I. So, birth together. You betcha. Twins, separated yep. at birth. Mm -hmm. I play with a bunch of guys that like these too, and they kind of got me aimed that way. But now mm -hmm. I love them. I've got several of these too. Yeah, I see you got you got a, the vanilla ones here today. So yes, yeah. But, uh, so I, what else will they do to the body to make it a little different? Then I've seen. So if well, I they go use to different NAM, woods. Yeah, but mm -hmm. this one is really solid, as you saw earlier when yes. you lifted it. Yes. Yeah, it uh, it's solid ash, this one, mm -hmm. and very heavy. And uh, one of the things they do too is with the maple neck that gives you a slightly different sound, a little snap. It's not there with the rosewood. Uh, depends on if you okay. like it too. No, I've seen them. Uh, people, you know, oh, I'll, I'll make it look like it's been on tour, and they'll take sandpaper oh, yes. to them or put on piece decals, and uh, doesn't yeah. really do much for I, the tone. Uh, but I get all upset when I get my first big ding on a nice guitar. Yes, that's, it does. It's that's, a little traumatic. That's the day. That's the neck pickup. This is from the custom shop too. It's like four position switch, so when I'm in this position, these pickups are in series. They're mm -hmm. normally parallel. So that gives me a little fatter. A little, little monstrous there. Now I can get that Strat sound. It throws them out of phase, so. Very good. All right, and then we have an acoustic sitting there in the back. Yes, we do. We have a little bit of time left, so if you don't mind. Yeah, you had mentioned that, so I made sure I brought it. Yes. All right, Ventura, while he's loading up here, uh, we want to make sure you get down to uh, Winchester Saloon, Kentara, Four Bricks, and you know, that will put in all the uh, adverts I can. Uh, the uh, Pat's getting the thought of giving people guitar lessons into his brain. He survived giving one to me, so hopefully that didn't put him off his feed and he's still thinking about it. 
Uh, yeah, and I see a lot of guitars are made in Mexico too now. Uh, yes. Yeah, so Mexico, Japan, too. and they're good. Yeah, you, you look at it first, you go, oh boy, that's the, that's not the one we want. Now, this is the hard part about an acoustic, isn't it? You, they like to the feedback. Yeah, yes. unless you stuff a sock in there or something. Usually run this through a PA, not through an amp. Mm -hmm. I uh, got this for my birthday. My son bought it for me. When I was in Nashville a couple years ago, all of the country guys had the black Takaminis. Mm -hmm. And I've got a Martin, and I've got a Gibson. I wanted a Takamini, so. I, I, said, you know, I said Nam in Nashville, and they had one made from carbon uh, fiber. Yes. And you could use it as a, as a canoe paddle. You can <laughs> smash, you can take the neck and bend it. Yeah. It wouldn't break off, and then I think that company went out of business, but. I bet, yeah. yeah. yeah it's, but yeah, this one is, a, I believe this is from Japan, Takamini. Takamini, yes. Uh, and they're really good, highly regarded. Yes. Uh, people love the sound, the, you know, the quality of the build, and. Yes. And all those guys I saw all up and down Broadway Street were playing these, I go, that's yeah. good enough for me. Yes, yeah, it's something you can, yeah, it's not. It's not a $6,000 Martin that you're afraid to pick up and play yeah, ever. I've, I've got a uh, Gibson 335 that my wife bought me some years ago for Christmas, and I'm afraid to take it out because I don't want anything to happen to it, yeah, which yeah. is kind of a shame. And she tells me, I didn't buy that for you not to play, so. Uh, I'll have to bring that sometime when I yes. play at your place. All right, well, Ventura, uh, it's time for you to get moving. Every band that Pat Simpson's in, for heaven's sake, it's time to support them. Uh, Winchester Saloon coming up October 2nd, 3rd, October 3rd. 3 to so, 6. And Turret, it's time for you to get moving. Go have a midlife crisis with <laughs> Pat and his band. <laughs>